Welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. I'm your host, uh, Charles Michael Mike Beaver. We, tonight we have a special guest, Debbie Solaris. Uh, Debbie, let me, where it changes. Okay, Debbie Solaris is uh, a galactic historian, an ET contactee, a starseed intuitive, and an interdimensional traveler, certified Akashic Records reader and star guide, a gifted intuitive using information channeled from her Arcturian and Pleiadian guides to heal and assist others on their own spiritual journeys. She's based in Colorado and provides readings and other intuitive services to clients all around the world. Uh, after a faithful extraterrestrial contact sp experience a few years ago, Debbie awakened to her true star lineage and higher calling. Through her ancestral connections with the Akasha Correctors, she has been receiving downloads of galactic historic historical information and universal spiritual knowledge ever since. She feels that it's a big part of her mission while on Earth to help awaken others to their own true divine selves and cosmic origins. Uh, she was recently featured on Beyond Belief Radio, on the on the Beyond, Beyond Belief Radio Show with George Norrie, and on Open Minds with Regina Meredith on Gaia TV Conscious Media. She offers visually appealing multimedia rich classes, webinars, and presentations on extraterrestrial life and culture, galactic history and ancient civilizations. And uh, she also offers light worker enrichment workshops. Uh, and uh, her website is www.debbysolaris.com. Welcome to tonight's show, Debbie Solaris. Thank you for having me. And I lost your video, so I don't know if there's something on your end or. Uh, um, well, know, you're really your video uh, is coming and going, and okay. since, since we've already reset my modem, I don't know that we want to do that again. Yeah, no, I don't think we need to do that again. It, I'm it, just letting you know I, I can't see you, so. Um, at all? Sure the, at all, yeah. Well, uh, I can see you come and go. You're coming and okay. going, and uh, when you're not live, it, it shows a frozen picture of you, but you should mm. Still, we should still be able to just do the audio portion, even if, even if the uh, video the comes and goes. Doesn't. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Uh, well, let's just uh, uh, plan to do this on an audio basis then. Um, but I'll keep my video up, you know, in the meantime. Well, um, so let's just get started. So, uh, tell me. When did, when did, what was the first strange thing that happened to you in your life or interesting thing or how far back does your memory go to when you were a child and did you, anything happen to you when you were really young or, or anything like that? Not really, you know, I uh, really had, I would say pretty ordinary childhood. Um, like a lot of star seeds, you know, I I'd always had that feeling of, Oh, I don't feel very connected to things here, or you know, you know, I don't feel like I belong here. I feel like I came from somewhere else, but you know, of course, I didn't have you know the background of information back then that I do now. So you know, it's just kind of like just passing feelings. It's not like I got any downloads of information. Um, but I don't think um, I really um, started awakening until about a month before my 50th birthday. Um, uh, so this was about, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago now, so this was back in 2012. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was raised in a Roman Catholic family, you know, we didn't talk about the paranormal. So I really, you know, wasn't that focused on the UFOlogy, ET, um, you know, agenda, you know. Um, now, my my husband is very interested and in, was always very interested in those things. So when I started dating him, uh, you know, he he more or less exposed me to some of that information. But even back then, I was very skeptical. I, you know, wasn't a big, you know, UFO believer at all. Uh, I didn't think aliens really existed. Um, so I had my own experience. Uh, and I would be the last person, I would say, that, would ever think that I would have any kind of experience like that. You know, like I said, I had a very ordinary upbringing, uh, never had any special, you know, 
psychic or intuitive gifts, you know, back then, you know, so, uh, uh, so when I did have my experience, it was very life changing, you know, it totally changed the t- entire trajectory of my life um, ever since then. So to explain, I would say as succinctly as possible, what happened to me, uh, I was starting, I think, to get exposed to, you know, just things that were happening in 2012, you know, with the Mayan calendar change, you know, this, you know, this change into this new age and uh, things that were going on in the planet. And I was pretty concerned, you know, as as somebody, I always kind of joke that I'm a spiritual war, warrior, a war, warrior, and a spirit, spiritual warrior. You know, so I was always worrying about things. So I was a little, I was worried for the planet. It just seemed like you know things were changing and not going in the right direction. Uh, so one night I went to sleep, and uh, or I was trying to go to sleep, but I couldn't sleep, and so I stayed up all night praying to the universe or praying to higher dimensional beings, uh, asking for divine intervention for, you know, the path for planet earth. You know, we, we needed assistance here. I, you know, cause I was concerned about wars, about the degradation of the, uh, of the environment, you know, the economic situation, you know, so all of it. And, so I sent out a prayer to God, Jesus, Mother Mary, the the Ascended Masters, uh, and even Galactic brothers and sisters, even though I wasn't even sure they existed. And just kind of sent it out and was thinking, okay, you know, I said a prayer and I forgot about it. And about two weeks, approximately two weeks after my sleepless night with the prayer, I went to sleep as normal and had a... Um, when I came to consciousness, uh, I found that I was um, in an alternate uh, dimension, and uh, and it looked like I was on board uh, some sort of a starcraft. And uh, I, you know, I mean, it was everything was so fantastical that. Um, I didn't even have time to be scared or to be fearful. I was just kind of trying to take it all in, trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, and I noticed that, you know, this uh, starship I was on uh, seemed, uh, it seemed very organic. So what didn't look like starships that you find, say, on a, in a sci-fi movie. So it didn't speaking from Star Wars or Star Trek or any sci-fi movies that, you know, people um, usually associate with starships. And it was very kind of light. It was comprised of light and some sort of plasma-like fluid material. But it it did have enough of a structure to where, yeah, it looked like a starship. Um, And I I was seeing it from the inside. You know, obviously I was inside the craft, you know. So... um, I could tell that uh, that there was a sentence about the ship because it kept like directing me towards a specific space. And so I was just kind of following along. And uh, eventually I found myself in this very large room or space and I encountered about four or five extraterrestrial beings. And uh, I have like a very clear memory of everything that happened um even 10 years later it still feels like you know this is something that happened yesterday Uh, and at the time you know i i knew right away these are not earth beings (laughs) you know i mean they looked like extraterrestrials uh if i had to describe what they looked like um they had humanoid features but kind of larger heads large eyes uh but not very alien-like. Um, kind of small. I mean, they were maybe about my height. I'm only five foot, so maybe maybe a little smaller. But their auras were so huge that when I, I couldn't even look at them directly. They were, I mean, it was so bright. It was a lot of colors. And so um, eventually uh, I did 
I, I, you know, I was trying to formulate questions in my head. Like, you know, I don't even know if these beings speak English. You know, I was, I was having like all these thoughts. Like, I don't even know how to communicate with them. Um, and so I was formulating thoughts in my head, like questions I wanted to ask them. And even before I could finish the question in my head, they were answering my questions telepathically, you know, so, so none of us opened our mouths and had to open our mouths. We were all communicating with each other telepathically, which was pretty freaking amazing. Uh, and uh, evidently there is no language barrier when you're communicating telepathically. Um, and uh, it was probably one of the most amazing, I mean, it was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. Um, so obviously I asked them, you know, where am I? What is this? Who are you? You know, why am I here? Because, you know, I'm not anybody special. You know, why you have me here? And and they answered all my questions. Uh, and they told me they were Arcturians from the Bonus constellation, from the star system of Arcturus. Uh, and they show, even showed me in a kind of a large holographic sphere um, that they had in the space that we were in. So they were showing me like a star map of where this place is located, and uh, and they and the and they told me the reason why they had me there was because they heard my prayer, and uh, uh, they were impressed, you know, by my concern for planet Earth, and felt like it was time for me to really know what was going on. Um, so I asked why me, because like I said, I'm nobody special. I don't I'm not. I'm not like a, you know, a UFO enthusiast, you know, not a spiritual person. And they told me it was because of my uh, soul connection and genetic connection with the Arcturus star race, you know, that I'm part of their family, that I had chosen as a soul to be on a mission on planet Earth. And uh, it and I mean, this was shocking to me. I mean, you know, I got, you know, I was taking all this in. I was like, you know, I, yeah, it was like so shocking that I didn't even know what to think at the time. Um, because like I said, I had a very ordinary upbringing, you know, I, um, you know, I didn't even really have a metaphysical path, you know, even before, um, you know, I had this experience. Uh, so, um, so just to kind of uh, make the, make the story go by a little faster for your for your listeners and your viewers is uh, they um, they answered a lot of my questions about uh, planet Earth, about what's really going on. Uh, the, the word that they used a lot, uh, they used this like, I think at least four or five times was that everything that we see in the 3D is an illusion. Um, and that um, not to be worried about things that are seemingly going really bad on planet earth because you know they had things under control you know that the, the the thing that they told me was that all of us that are on the path that are um light workers or star seeds or whatever you want to, you know whatever title you want to use um was protected you know and and so they said that my family was protected and at first I thought they meant my immediate family, you know, my earth family, but they were really talking about my light worker family, like all of us were protected. And so they gave me a lot of reassurance. Um, and, you know, they kind of, they kind of choked sometimes, like sometimes I would ask a question and they would kind of make a little bit of fun, but they weren't really uh, putting me down or anything. It was just like, you know, because of my earth conditioning, <laughs> you know, so, um, uh, just to give you an example of that, um, I was asking them, you know, they were showing me images of what in this holographic sphere about, um, and it, it it was a hologram, so so when you were in it, you felt like you were really experiencing it, you know, so they were showing me like an image of what Earth could be like, you know, if we made different choices here on planet Earth, and they showed me this very kind of organic um, view of Earth you know, where, uh, you know, we had houses that were integrated in the environment and people were growing their own food and that there wasn't big cities anymore. There were smaller communities and it was all very organic and uh, people would teleport their, their way 
place, you know, they would teleport to different places. You know, they, there was no need for airplanes and transportation anymore because you could just teleport yourself to wherever you wanted to go. And, uh, and it was such a beautiful image that I started crying and I asked them if this was just for rich people. <laughs> And they laughed at me because, of course, it, it was for everybody, you know. So, uh, um, so they, so they, they did, they did have a sense of humor, and uh, it was, it was very reassuring to hear that things were under control, that you know, things weren't going to hell in a handbasket, you know, completely. Even though that was the appearance of the way things were going on planet Earth. Uh, so they showed me around the ship um, and uh, they kind of cut me loose, let me wander on my own for a while. And I ended up in kind of like a big uh, atrium space where there was hundreds of other extraterrestrial beings. This, this ship was huge. It was like a city sized ship. Um, so there was actually hundreds of beings of various extraterrestrial races, not just Arcturians, you know, that were on the ship. Um, and it was weird because I would look at these various humanoid, most of them were kind of humanoid looking, and it was like, oh, there's a group of Syrians, or oh, there's a group of Pleiadians, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, weird how I knew that. And, uh, um, and then there was a weird thing where they had like these light shafts that would transport because the space was so huge they would transport people across the space. It looked like a like a rainbow like light shaft. And I was trying to get on this light shaft, you know, several times, uh, kept being thrown off of it until a Pleiadian looking being that caught me, you know, when I was thrown off like the third or fourth time telepathically told me that I needed to set intention of where I wanted to go first before stepping onto the light shaft, which I did. And then I got on the light shaft and transporting me across the space. And then the next thing I knew, I woke up and I was back in my bed. <laughs> and um, a lot of people, you know, were telling, you know, say like, well, maybe that's just a crazy dream you had. Um, but my answer to that is I knew it wasn't a dream because everything was hyper real. I mean, when you have when you're having a dream, even a lucid dream, there's kind of kind of a nebulous feeling or imagery with the dream. Um, this was so crystal clear. I mean, I, you know, like I said, I remember all the details of what happened. I, you know, even the details of the ship, the details of these beings were crystal clear. You could see the auras around things. Um, and so, you know, the colors were more brilliant. So I knew this wasn't a dream. Um, uh, and I had another experience on, on board the same starship um, in December. So the, my first experience was in May, the end of May. And then uh, my second experience was in December, where I was on board the same same thing happened. I fell asleep. You know, was in, in a different consciousness. Was on board the ship in the same orientation room I was in before with the Arcturians, except the second time I was uh, communicating with two uh, Pleiadian beings, uh, a male and a female. Um, I recognized the male because he was the one that was helping me with the light shaft, you know, the first time. And they were telling me a little bit more personal information about my family, about, I mean, my birth family and about certain people that I know, even my, my cat. I mean, it was just kind of weird, but uh, it was a much shorter visit. And then the same thing happened. I woke up and was back in my bed. You know? So... Oh. Um, I did notice that after I had these experiences, I was starting to have, it was like my extrasensory perception, you know, my uh, intuitive psychic gifts that just got turned on, you know, so um, are you going to ask me a question? I'm sorry. Uh, well, okay. that's okay. I, I was going to stop you because your voice is not, it, I can hear you, but it's not uh, perfect. And what I thought we could do is just stop this recording. It'll it'll still retain it if I stop okay. it pro properly, and then we can just go to audio straight audio because okay. you know your face is all frozen anyway. 
So, okay, well, let me just, um, I'll cut off the. Uh, let me, let me stop. The, well, you want to uh, try it without the video that way? Yeah, okay. let's try that and see if it makes the connection better. Let me uh, see your video anyway. So, how do I stop my video? So, let's see here. Without stopping the recording, I should be able to stop the video, right? Oh, yeah, I just did it. Yeah. How do you, how do you turn the video off? I just I just click that little button or with, with the camera button. OK. All right. it, didn't, it didn't disconnect the call, so it just it just disconnects the, the video. Your voice sounds clear now, so oh, we'll, good, just, good. we'll just go this I, way and see if that. Yeah, let's just works. do this. Yeah, so. Uh, um, so where do you want me to pick up from the actually? Uh, uh, it still sends video. Is it? You think it's still sending video back and forth? What do you think? No, I don't think so because I don't see your video and mine's turned off. All right. Well, keep going then. Uh, okay. Okay. You, um, you, uh, okay. So first of all, I have do have a question or two. So okay. you said you fell asleep before these things happened. What makes you think, other than the fact that your psychic uh, skills increased. What makes you think they weren't just dreams? Um, like I mentioned before, it was because of the clarity of the experience where things were crystal clear. I never had well, a dream like that. Okay, well, let me play devil's advocate a little more. Yeah, yeah. Instead of playing devil's advocate, the the real devil's advocate, let's let, let me jump to the other side. Uh, okay. There is uh, people get taken physically and they also get taken astrally. So if you started off in the dream world, they could have taken you without your body and like, OK, just for just for argument's sake, let's yeah. say you died. Right. And on mm -hmm. the other side, you met them like, you know, you're, you went through the tunnel and still the light on the other side of the tunnel. All of a sudden, there's a spaceship on the other side of the tunnel. Now, yeah, gotcha. er, people say when they die that on the other side, it's more real than here. So, and you were saying that it's more, it's, is it just as real or more real or what was it? It was real, like very more, real. Like, like I call it hyper reality. Like, okay, so uh, it, was, it was more real. So now the next question is, do you think you were physically taken or astrally taken or or what which one? I think it was more of an out of body experience. Like okay, so you body. don't you don't think you were yeah. in your physical body? No, I don't think so. I think I I when I look at myself, like I would look at my hands when I was on board the ship. I mean I still had my hands, you know, you know, so there was some semblance of my physicality that was there as far as what I think my physical body looks like, but I don't think I was physically there. I think it was an out-of-body experience. Like okay. my consciousness so, was, yeah. So do you think what happened was in your, you were like, you might've been dreaming or not dreaming. That's really unimportant. But yeah. at some point you went out of body and or astral projected, you went to their realm. So yeah. Do you think they are physical or if they're or they have the ability to go back and forth or what do you think about them? Um, I think they were in a higher dimensional state. Right. Um, That's what I figured you would say. OK, yeah. so you went out of your body and instead of going in the, like a lower astral realm, you either went to the upper astral realm or you went to a higher realm, higher dimension than the astral. Well, something yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I had this feeling like they were pulling their vibration down just to interact with me. Uh, right. But yeah, you, you, know, you went that, up and they went down. Exactly. And met in the yeah, middle. So, so they kind of met in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so when you met them, uh, everything looked, everything appeared physical, though, right? Yeah, I mean, it, there was, you know, there was, you know, a sense of structure. It wasn't like really super nebulous. I mean, there was a, a, you know, a room. There was, you know, maybe some form of furniture in the room, or you know, maybe some chairs or something. You know, seating. Uh, um, 
you know, so it looked physical, but just the way that everything kind of shifted, it kind of felt like, uh, like it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, structured or it wasn't made out of materials that we uh, would recognize here on earth, you know, so it wasn't metallic at all. It was uh, more like plasma like, but there was enough of a structure where you didn't feel like you were just floating out in space, you know, you were in a actual room. And so when you first appeared on the craft for the first time. Yeah. Uh, Take us through the actual moment by moment. You know, what what kind of, were you in a big room, a small room, uh, colors, aliens present, all the details? Um, when I first arrived, it felt like I was in some sort of a, a, a hallway or an entryway. Um, it's kind of hard to explain it, but it didn't feel like I was in a big space. It just felt like I was in some sort of a hallway or, or a passageway. Uh, and the colors were, I mean, brilliant. I mean, it was just like, uh, I, I mean, I can't even describe them because some of them were colors I'd never even seen um, that are outside the color spectrum here on Earth. And uh, I mean, there was enough of uh, a, I mean, there was a floor, you know, there was enough of a, a, a structure where you know, I didn't feel like, oh, I'm exploding here. You know, it just felt like, you know, oh, I'm, I was being led. Um, and, I, and it's hard to explain how the ship was leading me. It just kind of felt like it was guiding me to a bigger space. So did, um, did, you, did you feel like you were talking to the ship? Yeah, I felt like there was kind of a guidance. Uh, it, it wasn't really uh, like communication like words, you know, so. But it was telepathy, some type of it was telepathic, yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, kind of felt like it was silently guiding me to this alternate space within the ship. Um, so did you hear, but, did you hear words or did you get impression, visual impressions in your mind or what, what kind of. Uh, what kind of communication? When people say telepathy, they they say it, you know it comes in a lot of different flavors. You know, there's there's oh uh, yeah, there's uh, there's images. There's some people say it comes so fast that you know they can hardly keep up with it. And you know, do you, uh, do you give us a flavor of your telepathy? Um, with the ship, it was more like images. Um, or this uh, clairsentient feeling of, oh, it's guiding me, you know, oh, you know. Um, but I, it wasn't like actual language or words. Uh, it was just this feeling and some some uh, imagery. Uh, but you found, yourself, you found yourself in a larger space with lots of aliens at some point, right? Yeah, at, uh, at the, the end of my... Um, my experience uh when, initially when i when i was in the orientation room you know after the ship led me there i was in there with uh four or five other extraterrestrials so um describe that it was you. i'm sorry describe them uh like i said they were uh larger heads i mean they looked humanoid but definitely not from earth uh Larger heads, kind of greenish blue skin tone. It's kind of hard to tell because the auras they had were so bright that, like, a lot of times I couldn't look directly at them. In order, I had to sneak glances at them through periphery. Like, a, like sometimes I would, you know, catch glimpses of them, what they looked like behind the auras. But, um, but the beings were. Um, Larger eyes. They had pupils and irises. They had four or five fingers. It was kind of hard to tell. I mean, they looked like streamlined versions of humans, but not great aliens. Uh, their features were different than what I've seen great aliens depicted as, where it was a little bit more refined, uh, maybe higher cheekbones. Uh, you know, um, they seem very friendly beings. Uh, I wasn't afraid of them. Uh, so when you say they were bright, uh, what 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 kind of brightness was coming off? The colors or a light or what was what was bright? Um, their auric fields. 
like they had like an aura around them. So you could yeah. see their auras. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what colors were their auras? A bunch of different colors? A bunch of different colors. Like I said, it was like the ship where you couldn't, I, there were some colors I've never seen. Uh, but, like I said, it was, I mean, there are some obviously that we, you know, would recognize like there were the purples and blues and uh, I don't know, some, some golds, but there was also some colors I couldn't even describe. Had you ever uh, seen, had you ever seen uh, auras prior to this uh, uh, event? Experience? Uh, no. Oh, so that was, the, no. you saw their auras and it was the first time you'd ever seen anybody's aura, right? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, like I said. Um, earlier, I, uh, I I didn't have any spiritual gifts, you know. It was like I wasn't trained, you know, metaphysically, you know. I and, and you know follow spirituality. For and they and they told you they were from Arcturus, yes. That's what they told me. Uh, and, and they spoke to you telepathically. Yeah, they were. I was formulating questions in my head because trying, you know, think if I could ask them, and before I could finished a question in my head for answering my questions but they're answering it telepathically now the arcturians communicated differently than the ship did so the ship was kind of showing like some you know images or this clairsentience feeling but with the arcturians they were using actual language along with visual images so um and yet they also had this uh holographic sphere within that we were all kind of within, it was like this huge sphere in this room that they were showing me. So so it was kind of like I was experiencing what they were showing me, uh, which is hard to describe, but kind of like, let's say you're you're inside a video game, you know, like, like you've, like there's an avatar aspect of you that's inside a video game. That's kind of how it felt like, like there was some sort of reality to it, but, um uh it was it was technology i've never seen it but you was, were in uh, you said you were in a sphere is that what you said well it was kind of like a um a sphere like a hologram like uh like they would show me images within the sphere but it also felt like you were experiencing the images they were showing you so right so so, was, so did you it, it, since I think you were, uh, you said you were on a higher, you felt like you were on a higher dimension when you're on the ship, and so yeah. um, is there something about the whole experience uh, that you know, like um, the dimension itself, which you think is not unique to their ship or them, which you know, are there things you could say about? You know, first of all, what do you have any idea what dimension it was? And second, was there anything about the whole experience that you could say is like, like uh, this dimension is X, Y, or Z that you think goes beyond their ship? That does that mm -hmm. ring a bell? Um, never really. I mean, they never told me what dimension I was in, so I, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I know it was at least fifth dimension, if not higher. I mean, this is my first time experiencing higher dimensions, so I didn't know what, what so dimension you, I was in. But, so you, um, had, you had uh, your first experience, how many aliens did you meet on your first, the first um, time? Actually, face-to-face uh, uh, -face me, um, there was the, the four or five Arcturians and then the Pleiadian that was in the huge atrium-like space that, you know, but I saw a lot of aliens so it wasn't those were the only aliens that were on board the ship those are the ones i personally interacted with um, so so can you name their names or did you did they give you their names they might have but um, but you don't remember everything yeah i don't remember like all every single so that, detail yeah so that was your first ex in your first experience did you See, did you get go through the, all throughout the ship, or how much time? How much time did it feel I like? Was, I was there for a while. I mean, uh, how long that was, it was hard to say because the time didn't seem linear. It seemed like time was moving faster or slower. I don't know. 
Um, I mean, obviously, when I woke up the next day, you know, it was the next day. You know, so, you know, obviously, I was maybe in space for seven hours of our time. But I can't even tell you how long of time I was there as, in accordance with their time because it felt like I was there for a while. Like, but you think they told you mentally or telepathically that they were from Arcturus? Yeah, they did tell me Arcturus. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was, and they didn't give you any names, and and uh, so they were. D describe them one more time, please. They had. Um, they weren't super tall, so you know a lot of times with extraterrestrials people describe them as being tall. Um, these beings weren't tall. I'm only five foot, and they were maybe at least my height, maybe smaller. I don't know. Um, like it's hard to tell because of the bright auras, but. They had larger heads, uh, larger eyes. Uh, eyes had irises and pupils. They didn't look like the black, gray alien eyes. Right, at right. All. I remember that. Yeah. Part. Um, and uh, kind of uh, very. They had noses, but very um, minimal. Um, high cheekbones. Uh, kind of a bluish, greenish cast of their skin. But I couldn't tell if that was their actual skin tone, or maybe it was just. Uh, reflection from the aura, but um, it did appear bluish green, and uh, they, they kind of um, lacked hair. I don't know. It was kind of hard to. Did their uh, did their skin uh, shimmer, or did they have any su uh, suits on? It looked like they had clothing on. Um, I said kind of hard to tell. Maybe just suits. I don't know. Um, but you said uh, their least, skin was bluish green. Bluish green, and they had, uh, it was kind of shimmery a little bit. Um, so did you, uh, have you seen Elena Denon's uh, book, uh, uh, Gift from the Stars, something, something oh, yeah, like that? I have that book, yeah. Uh, okay, have you gone through it and tried to find your aliens? Um, I mean, they they look like classical Arcturians, you know, because okay. I've okay. read, you know, We the Arcturians by Dr. Norman Milanovich, and I, I read, uh, you know, Do, uh, David K. Miller's books on Arcturians and Tom Kenyon's books on Arcturians. But okay. After that experience, I was reading all the books about the Arcturians. But okay, you know, so so we've gone through your first experience, sort of. Uh, right, right. The biggest the biggest room you were in on that ship. How big was the room and describe it? Uh, the biggest room was the atrium, which I, I wouldn't really call it a room, just a space. It, was, it looked like it was in the middle of the ship, or like the centermost point of the ship. And it was several stories tall. I mean, it was a huge space. Uh, the, si the, the ship itself, like it was large and like a city side. I mean, it was huge. Right, right, right. Um, and go, go to your... Uh, Second experience again. You said you had okay. another one. Yeah, I had a second experience in uh, December two thousand and twelve, where um, the same thing happened. I fell asleep. I came to. I was in the consciousness. Um, and this time, I was directly in the original orientation room where I met the Arcturians. You know, so uh, so it was the same room. Where I was communicating with the Arcturians, but at that point, it wasn't the Arcturian there. It was two Pleiadian beings, one male and one female. Um, the male I recognized as the same Pleiadian male who helped me when I was in the atrium trying to get on the light shaft. And so I recognized him right away. I didn't recognize the female. Um, she never spoke. She was just sitting there. He was the one that was communicating with me telepathically so it was just kind of a similar thing where um except there was no holographic sphere it was just me communicating with these two beings uh arcturians and, no uh pleiadians, uh, pleiadians. Okay. okay yeah, yeah. so uh describe the pleiadians the male was very tall i've never seen anybody that tall i would say at least eight feet I don't know, maybe seven, eight feet. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, he was wearing sort of a, it looked 
like some sort of shirt and pants. Might have been a jumpsuit, but it was kind of uh, like like a light blue, as far as I can tell, but it had like a lot of strands of silver. I kind of got the impression that the, the silver metallic strands were like some sort of bio suit or, or some sort of uh, biological component to the, um, to, to the outfit he was wearing. Uh, and they looked more human. I mean, they looked like, more or less like very, very attractive earth humans. Um, but their skin had kind of a luminosity to it that I've never seen with earth humans. Um, their skin so or the suit, their suit? The skin, the, the skin. skin. Yeah. What color was their skin, Did like ours? Kind of like ours, but maybe more golden or more, like, like I said, it was kind of like maybe like ours, but golden, like it looked, he looked Caucasian, but or he had Caucasian-like features, but it was it was gold. I, don't know, I can't even. Uh, I've never seen like that kind of level of luminosity with a, a human on Earth. Uh, so they were given off. They were given off a brightness. A brightness. He, but they. But you weren't seeing the big auras like the first one. No, not with like with Arcturians. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. I mean, the hair was shiny, the eyes were brilliant. I mean, he had like bluish, greenish eyes. Was, like I said, it was very, um, I mean, just a luminosity to their features. Uh, very attractive. It's like, um, so, you so, don't even see Earth humans that look, I mean, attractive Earth humans that look like this. It's so they were like, good looking. They were very good looking. Yeah, they were very good looking. And the female was very good looking. Um, she too was. And they were given off. And they were given yeah. off uh, a lot of light. Just everything, the, even their hair. It was all bright, or just parts of them were bright. No, it was all bright. All um, bright. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I don't know. It was shiny or luminous. Uh, they just contained this this high frequency. You know that was just so, emanating out of their pores. You know. So, so go, go ahead and go through the experience. Um, so the first thing he told me was, I don't know how much, how long we can hold you here because we're having issues with the, uh, frequency or holding the lower frequency to have you here. So we, we have, so you need to pay attention. So he was telling me, he told me three times I needed to pay attention. And so I said, okay, I'm listening to you. you know, what is it that you want to tell me? And then he, he was talking about um, some members of my family, particularly my father, because my father committed suicide. And basically what he told me was that, um, unlike what they teach us on earth, you know, Roman Catholic uh, beliefs is that if someone commits suicide, they go straight to hell. He's a right, right. You know, earth human. That's not real. That's an earth human fallacy. And that, he, he said uh, that to you. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead. And uh, something about uh, that my father was being processed. Like my father's soul was in the processing. Uh, like he, and uh, so he was, I think, trying to tell me not to worry about my father's soul because um, there is no no hell no heaven you know this okay is so dimensions. so basically what you're saying is what you're giving the audience the information you're giving the audience at this moment is yeah. that higher dimensional extraterrestrials understand the afterlife and are connected into that oh yeah yeah definitely uh okay go ahead keep, keep going to through, keep going through the experience then go ahead Okay, uh, and it's really interesting how they seem to know my father personally, or they, um, I mean, the way they were talking about him, were like, you know, oh yeah, we know that soul, you know, it was kind of like very personal, and it's not like, oh yeah, that's just some random soul, you know, it's like, yeah, I know who this soul is. Um, uh, so they, so they, uh, 
So they gave you a familiarity of your dad, that, that they knew your dad very, very well. Exactly. Yeah. And so it kind of made me feel like, like maybe he was just playing a role or, you know, or there was some sort of soul contract and maybe the, even his you know, death, you know, because he did commit suicide. I, don't know, I wouldn't say it was planned, but maybe there was, uh, you know, a higher spiritual uh, meaning to it, or maybe meant as an activation. I don't know. But well, did, when you when you knew your dad, did you ever get the notion ever, even once in your whole life, that your dad might have had a previous life at a higher level? Oh, totally. Yeah. You did get that idea. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I always sort of felt like there was something about my dad that was supernatural. I don't know if that makes. I mean, because he was an extremely gifted person. Uh, I mean, he was military. I mean, he spent his whole career in in, in the army. But um, he was one of those people that he was just gifted in so many different areas that it kind of makes you feel like you know um, he was like bigger than life. You know, one of those really strong personalities um and a spiritual aspect to him you know uh there was a part of him that, you know he was always uh very curious about spirituality about you know the world around us about the universe you know so so he had a very um, open mind oh totally yeah totally uh, probably more so than you would think some of his generation would have yeah. So um, what else did the alien uh, continue going through the experience with the Pleiadians? Pleiadian. Um, so they were, they were talking about my dad's soul. Um, and then uh, they switched gears and started talking about, I had a very interesting um, cat uh, who was a registered therapy animal. And she and I did... Um, a cat? Um, a cat, yeah. My, it was a my cat. You, yeah. you had a cat that was a therapy animal. That was a, that was a registered therapy animal. That she was trained to be a ther therapy animal. And she was a very unusual cat in the sense that there were very human-like aspects to her. Like she, she kind of had an awareness of her surroundings. We did assisted therapy for six years together. We... Uh, worked with the Wounded Warriors program at Fort Carson, which is a military base in Colorado, and uh, we worked with the American Red Cross. And I always kind thank, of felt like uh, something different. Thank you, about thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for your service. No, thank you. I'm so I'm also a Navy veteran, so I'm are you? Service. What I rank? Am, yes. What rank did you uh, did you retire? Um, I never retired. I just went through a six-year enlistment, but um, I was in I think an E4 by the time I got out, so I never quite made it to chief. But um, so you went, you went six years? Yeah, six years. Yeah. Um, and E4. What's what's an E4? What what did what what did you do when you were when you were uh, your okay. last duties? Um, yeah, that's a yeah the E four. That's kind of like an enlisted level four. So I wasn't quite what you would call like a sergeant, like maybe a, I don't know, a corporal, similar to a corporal. I guess, okay. Maybe in yeah. Um, go go, go uh, back for continue going through your alien your uh, yeah play, alien experience. Yeah. Yeah. Your play so, uh, experience. But but to answer very quickly, what I did, I was a hospital corpsman. So I. Uh, you, know, I, a, I did a you were a what? Hospital, a hospital corpsman, so I worked. Ah, there we go. Ship. So you worked in a yeah. hospital ship. Yeah, so I was I was a medical a medical person when I was in the military. Uh, but going back to the alien experience, uh, so I, I before I even had this experience, I was working, you know, doing animal assisted volunteer work, animal assisted therapy uh, with this cat who was a therapy yeah, animal, yeah. and. They were telling me that my cat was actually a soul that originated from the Pleiades and um, and that she had chosen to be on the planet to help. You're talking about your cat? You're talking about your cat? My, yeah, my cat. Yeah, okay, so. yeah. I didn't. Your voice is kind of coming and going. 
So they're yeah. talking about your cat and they said you're and tell tell me again or tell us again what, what what did they say about your cat that she was a, actually a soul that originated from the pleiades that, okay. uh had a soul contract uh i know it sounds like crazy stuff uh like i said no it, it doesn't it, yeah. uh, okay yeah. so let me let me let's let's go back to me let's go to me for a second okay okay i had a dream one time uh in the dream it was a lucid dream, first of all. It wasn't a regular. Yeah, yeah. It was a lucid dream. Okay, I yeah. saw I saw a uh, a light that was taking up pretty much my whole vision, my whole field, everything. And this light was kind of almost like a triangle, but there was no defined edges. It was uh, slightly thinner at the top and wider at the bottom, but it was just a, a a light. And the only thing I could see besides the light was a shadow at the bottom of the light. It was going left and right, back and forth, back and forth, left to right, right to left. And the shadow, you know, I'm looking at this light and I see this shadow and I'm like, what is this I'm looking at? You know, I'm totally awake in my dream, inside my dream, uh, mm -hmm. a loose dream. And I'm like, what am I looking at? Instantly, I get the idea, I get the answer. What I was looking at was my dog, the first dog I had when I was a child. Now, think about, I was getting more love from this light than I'd ever gotten in my entire life. And you think about, you know, your dog dies. Well, if your dog lives on, he's still a dog, right? No, the dog is, the dog is like uh, any creature that exists, or even a tree, you know, a planet, whatever. It's a spirit that inhabits a physical vessel. And when he gets exactly. out... Yeah. It can be any shit, you know, when you're a ghost, when you're, let's say you're an ex-human, you can be an yeah. orb, you can be an orb as an energy uh, mm -hmm. orb, you can be an ectoplasm, you can manifest as a human, you can literally, your energy, so you can be literally any shape you want. So the dog is not really a dog, he became a dog for 16 years, and his real self is the spirit that inhabited the that physical vessel, just like you and me. So yeah. they're not less, they're not less than us. That's human thinking. So back to your cat, your cat, yeah, back to the it's cat. not really a cat. Your cat, really a cat. Is, your cat is a spirit who chose to be a cat for a short period of time. Yeah. So she was on the planet for 17 years or I don't know, she was almost 18 and then she passed. But, right. uh, but during the time that we were together, um, she was an unusual cat in that um, I could take her anywhere and she would just adapt to the environment. You know, most cats are very skittish, you know, and, uh, you know, they don't like change. And this was a cat that was, you know, very outgoing, interacting with people. So I just had this, I don't know, I was watching Animal Planet and one, one day and was watching a show about therapy animals. And I thought, wow, I think. My cat Piglet, that was her name, Piglet. She was a <laughs> hairless cat. Yeah, it's cute. hairless cat. Yeah, it was cute. Yeah. So Pig, I thought Piglet can do that work. So she and I went through the animal system therapy training with the American Humane Association in Denver and got certified. And we did a plethora of volunteer work between, I would say, 2009 and 2015. Um, where we were um, actively, uh, we were, we did, uh, we were, we, we worked with uh, assisted living programs. We worked with the American Red Cross at Fort Carson, the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, we also uh, did read, uh, pause to read program at the local libraries um, in in the area that we were in. Uh, we actually did some. I mean, it was a, a massive amount of volunteer work, and, and this whole time, you, you know, and, they, and, and what did I'm the sorry. aliens? What did the aliens say about your cat? That she was a soul from the Pleiades. That she was part of the Pleiadian High Council. That she was like a very advanced soul, um, but that she chose to be on. Uh, she had a soul contract with me to help activate me, um, and so that was part of my training was you know to do this therapy work with her that so was you, part of my training yeah so your cat came to earth to help you uh evolve evolve exactly yeah 
to help cool. align me with my true path. Yeah. That's very, uh, if you understand spirits, there's nothing uh, unbelievable about that. I've, I, I had a client who, he had clients, uh, as a hypnotherapist, I had a client who had a client who was a, an amoeba before, and I had a client, that the client I was just talking about, who had the other client who was an amoeba, he, uh, the first client, my client was uh, an eagle, a hawk or an eagle, and uh, I've taken a lady, the very first lady I took to a future life as a hypnotherapist, she was a fish as a future in a future life, and mm -hmm. that's another story. But anyway, go on with uh, your cat is from the Pleiades. She came here to activate you. What else did the aliens give you? Um, and uh, they told me that her her the rest of her time was limited, um, so they were preparing me that. You know, well, she, she was still alive. She was still alive at the time. Yeah, she was. Yeah, but they just said that you know. Um, you know, be prepared, you know, because they, they knew that I had this really strong bond with my cat and they, they were just telling me to be prepared because her time, her, her contract on the planet was limited, you know, so, uh, so they were letting me know that she was going to pass on at some point. Uh, how, how long, how much longer did she live after that event? Um, let's see, it was, uh, let's see, she lived, um, that was 2012, and she lived until 2017, so it was a few more years, but not many more years, you know, so. Well, my, was, uh, my, uh, my, uh, dog died at 16, so. Yeah. yeah about, so a, she, about a month ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, That's okay. Uh, yeah, no. what, what else did the aliens tell you in that event? Um, and then it was, it was weird. Uh, they said, oh, uh, I was, I was having lunch with a friend the next day, the, a friend that who aligns with the Pleiadians. And uh, I don't know, it's just kind of crazy that they knew this, but they said, oh, we know you're meeting with uh, Dawn. Uh, that's my friend, Dawn. Um, and we know that Dawn is trying to reach out to us. And uh, and just that we got her messages, but we can't respond because uh, there's something in her field that's blocking us from the messages coming through. So then the next day I met with Dawn. I said, you're never going to believe the experience I had. And, you know, the aliens even mentioned you. And um, and they said that you were trying to send the messages. And she said, oh, my God, how did you know? You know, and I said, they, that's what they told me. Um, so what, what did, uh, this is your friend Dawn? Dawn, yeah, D-A-W-N, yeah. Dawn. What did the aliens say about her? They just said that they, they didn't say much about her, except that they knew that she, was, she, she had a soul connection with them, and she was trying to send messages to them, like either telepathically or maybe energetically, I don't know. But, is she um, public about her experience, uh, or... Uh, her um, ET connections? Um, she was to me. I mean, she she did. I mean, because after that was after the first time I had the experience, and then uh, well, I'm not saying she's open to you. I'm saying it, has she come out publicly with her ET connections? No, I don't think so. I mean, okay, I, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. If she yeah. wants to come out public, have her give her my number. Okay, will do. Yeah. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, what else did they tell you in this one event? Um, the conversation about Dawn was the last uh, conversation. And it kind of felt like, oh, I'm getting pulled away. And then next thing I knew, I woke up, you know. So, um, uh, but they did tell me that they were trying to send messages back to her, but it wasn't quite going through. So they wanted me to let her know that they did receive her messages. Um, um, so what, did, which, what, did she, what is her connection with the Pleiadians? Um, she considers herself a Pleiadian starseed. So she, she feels that her soul originated from the Pleiades. And so what is she trying to send them uh, a message for? I have no idea. They didn't tell me. <laughs> so oh, so she's yeah. trying to send the messages and they just told you we, we got her messages. Yes. Yes. They, they, didn't, they weren't specific about what how, I was telling them. Yeah. How many times have you been on ships? Um, 
I would say uh, as far as out of body type experience, probably just these two times. Uh, I don't know. I can't. There was also other times where I felt like I've had astro travels or or um, where I was on board ships even after these experiences where it felt like, oh gosh, I'm on. This. I had one experience where I felt like I was on a Galactic Federation ship and. Uh, so I'll stop for a second. So you're. Yeah. The two ships you were just the two times you're on ships just now the two events you don't you don't think that those are galactic federation ships no they probably were yeah i would they I probably would, were I mean, okay I, yeah okay, I think, go, go ahead go ahead yeah i think they were uh but then there was also uh at least one other time um maybe like two or three years later where I, I felt like I was having, uh, going through some after travels uh, where I, I was on board two, two other ships, two different ships than the, the first one that I was on on two, 2012. So, uh, and then there was all the times where I, after my can, experience that- can you, can you go through those experiences or, or not? Oh, yeah, no, I can. Um, so this was a really weird, like uh, it was different than the first two experiences. So the this experience was I was trying to heal or help out a friend. Um, I had my my teacher uh, had a concussion. Um, she was my my spiritual teacher, and uh, she was having terrible migraine headaches and. So kind of half jokingly, I told her, well, uh, I think Clint and I are going to go in the astral and try to heal you. You know, it was just kind of like a joke. Um, and she says, oh, yes, do that. Oh, do that. And, um, and so I said, really, you want me to do that? And she said, yes. So uh, that night, I said an intention that wherever it is I needed to go to help heal her, um, that was what's going to happen. And I was wanting to remember it so that night i fell asleep and i found myself on board a smaller craft it, there were maybe i don't know eight eight extraterrestrial beings on this craft um not the hundreds that i saw in the previous experience and these beings uh they all looked alike i don't know they, they were human they were tall with light colored hair um but they all kind of looked similar to each other. Um, so, so I don't even know if they were Pleiadian. I don't know what race of beings they were. Um, uh, and uh, they told me, oh, no, you're on the wrong ship. Um, you need to be, and they were giving me coordinates to another ship that I need to be on. So I said, okay. And then I woke up and I was like, what? You know, and a cat was next to me on the bed. So my cat was going with me on these astro travels too. And, and so then I fell asleep again, and then I was on board a much smaller craft. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Back, back up, back up. Okay. How, how, did you, how, did you, how did you get the idea your cat was on the astral travel, uh, the, the, your travels? How did you know your cat went with you? Um, because I could see her and I could feel her presence. When you're on, when you're on the ship. Yeah, yeah, she was there next to me. Yeah. Did she look um, like a cat or did she look like something else? She looked like a spirit. Like it, I didn't see her in cat form. It was more like a spirit or, um, or like a light. I don't know. It's hard to explain. But the could presence, you see? Could you see your body, your own body, when you were in this particular experience? Not in this particular experience. It was, it was like I was interfacing with these beings, but I didn't see my physical body. Okay. And do you yeah. think it was the same uh, dimension as the other two experiences that you mentioned previously, or do you think it might have been a different dimension? Might have been a slightly lower dimension because the ship looked a little bit more metallic or a little bit more like a like a ship, you know. Um, I, it's, it's hard to say because I, like I said, I, 
I can't discern between what, what makes a difference between fifth dimension or sixth okay. dimension. It's, but that's fine. That's fine. So yes. you saw you're on the ship, right? You you saw right. your cat, your the spirit of your cat, and um, you recognized your cat as the spirit of your cat because you felt you just had a knowing that that's who it was. Yeah, you know, just the the energy felt like her, and uh, and you know, we were telepathically communicating with each other. So uh, and what and if you can go through the experience on the ship with your cat. Uh, Other than they told you you're on the wrong ship. Anything yeah, else? Okay. Yeah. So I found myself on a bridge, what looked like a bridge or uh, like a control center. And there was maybe six or eight uh, extraterrestrial beings. They were all wearing like blue jumpsuits, but li very light colored blue. Um, and they had humanoid features, but unlike the Pleiadians that were in the previous ship in 2012, these beings all looked similar to each other. It was even the, they were, I could tell it was like a couple of females and some males, but. They all they had very similar features, so I don't know what race of beings they were. Um, but they had very light colored skin, light hair. The hair was short. Um, and uh, I, it's kind of hard to explain, but I mean, but for the most part, they looked humanoid. Um, okay. Maybe a little bit taller, but not as tall as the Pleiadians interacted with. Um, and and did, did you look through uh, Lana's book to f see if you could find out who these particular aliens were? Um, I didn't see anything that looked exactly like them in her book. Um, if I had to guess, they were probably not Pleiadians, but maybe, um, I don't know, might have been Alpha Centaurians or maybe Aldean. It's okay. You, you don't. You don't need to guess. You don't need to guess. I mean, if yeah. you don't. I mean, it was. I, I. I didn't see anything that looked exactly like these beings. If that's what you're asking. But, okay. So uh, after after they told you uh, that you're on the wrong ship, is there anything else that happened in this particular event? No, I just woke up. And okay, and then go go on with your. Uh, you said you had another one, another uh, fourth one, fourth uh, ship. Well, then that same night I fell asleep again, and uh, I was on a different ship, the 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 the, the ship that the ship you were supposed to be on the first time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Was your cat with you this time? Yeah, she was with me. Piglet and Pig, Piglet was with me, and okay. I saw like some sort of a pod you know like there was uh, a soul aspect of my teacher that was in this pod and i know this sounds really crazy but i knew soul, that was her uh, inside the pod yeah so, soul, so say all that again you, there was one or two words that didn't come through okay okay uh, let me, and i'll slow it down a little bit too um uh, so when this was, was a much smaller ship um much smaller than the the first one where I had the wrong coordinates, and then uh, there was a it contained a pod like a a body pod like a body sized pod, and uh, somehow I knew that my teacher's soul aspect was in this pod. Your teacher. Yeah, the teacher Ooh. that was having the headaches. You know that I was trying to help out. When you oh you, okay so back back up uh, your 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 teacher asked you to go on the astral to to fix something correct exactly yeah okay and your teacher was te taught you what uh, she was my teacher and mentor for a few years after my experience uh, she was Native American she taught everything she was she taught about. Um, Crystal healing, Native American medicine. I mean, she taught everything. So she was a Native American shaman healer. Or, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And um, is she public or did she care to have her name known or what? Um, 
she's asked me not to share her name. So that's, that's fine. That's that's yeah. fine. Okay, so and, your 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 uh, teacher. And she's, and she's a lot. Uh, she's not with us anymore. So she's passed on. So, okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So you were on the ship at her behest. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I was there to help her. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, uh, and what was the what was the reason she asked you to go in the astral? What? Why? What was the? What were you trying to help her with? Uh, she was having massive headaches due to uh, having a concussion, um, and uh, they were debilitating. So, um, my, migraine headaches. Migraines, yeah. Massive, okay. massive migraine headaches. Okay, well, go, go through the experience on the ship about what they said about the whole the whole ship experience. Go back to that and continue that. Uh, I mean, uh, the first ship I was on. No, no, the the one the one you're telling about now, the second, the fourth. Oh, this ship, ship. The, the the fourth. Okay, so fourth. this one was smaller. Um, it didn't look like anybody was on board the ship it was only like a pod like oh a yeah ship the, was the human sized pod a human sized pod and there was uh i knew that her soul aspect was in this pod although your teacher this is my soul uh, my teacher's soul aspect not my soul aspect but her soul aspect was in so what well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a second so what does the yeah. soul aspect look like i don't know because i couldn't see it <laughs> it was in the oh, pod. but you knew it was there I knew it was there. Yeah, I, I recognized it. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll keep going through the experience. And I asked my cat Piglet, do you know what to do? Because I don't know what to do. <laughs> my cat Piglet said, yes, I know exactly what to do. So her soul aspect was, uh, it was kind of like she, she, she kind of had like a form, but a light body form. But she was making some adjustments on the pot, like there was like little dials or buttons or something that there was a um, kind of a technical um, aspect to the pod. Um, and she was making some adjustments with the uh, with with the controls on the pod. And I was just sitting there watching her do this, so I didn't do anything. You know, so I was just sitting there watching her making adjustments on the pod and then the, my cat said oh we're done here we're uh we can go back and then i woke up again i was back in my bed and my cat was next to me okay um the very next morning i called my teacher and i said uh well we i told her what happened i said you know this is what happened and she's oh my god she said this morning was the first morning i woke up where didn't have a headache at all where it was the first morning in months that i woke up where i had no headache um, so so okay so um all right so her did you ever find out from that month from the time you were on the ship with her soul aspect to the present did you ever mm -hmm. find out what was causing her migraines that 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 you know you your cat, uh, Piglet, adjusted the the uh, body size pod settings, and it fixed her headache. Did you ever come to the notion, the understanding of what was causing her headache? Well, she had a car accident, um, like a year before our experience. You know that particular experience. Oh, so and it was probably the as a result of the car accident. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And she she got a she she went through a concussion because of the car accident, and she was having uh, issues with headaches and neurological issues afterwards because of the car accident. So, um, okay. So, let me let me see if I can wrap my mind around this. Okay. So, you, um, her soul aspect was on this ship. Do you mm -hmm. did you ever get an understanding of how? Um, you know, how did like maybe a, a, a higher perspective understanding of how her soul aspect can be on the ship? She's in her body, and I mean, it, you, with you, you're physically asleep, your astral body is on the ship, 
her soul mm -hmm. aspect is also on the ship. But mm -hmm. I guess my point here is not how that can all be, but more like why did she end up on, you know, I know you're there to to help her, right? Mm -hmm. And with her headaches. And, and but you get my drift. I'm trying to figure out if um how do I put this? If she showed up in that pod on that ship in order to fix her headaches, or is she in she like permanently there and here? Or you know, you get my where I'm coming Yeah, from. no, I understand what you're asking. Uh and I think it was like she was permanently there, but also here. That's the okay. impression that I got. Yeah. So that was just another piece of her. Exactly. Yeah. Like something that there were some adjustments that had to be made in order to give her relief, like with that aspect of her to give her relief also with the aspect of her that was on planet Earth. So so, uh, so that's a permanent part of her there. Tweaking, mm -hmm. tweaking the surroundings of her the aspect of her on that higher level fixed her here. Yes? Exactly. Yeah. And for oh. some reason, Karen knew exactly what to do. <laughs> uh, you're, uh, Piglet sounds like a very advanced soul. Yeah, she is. Uh, that was what the Pleiadians told me, that she was very, very advanced soul. Yeah. Um, more well, advanced. You're, than you're very fortunate to have had a life with Piglet. No, I am. I was thinking, you know, the universe every day for my soul contract with her, you know, that I had the opportunity to work with her as closely as I did, you know, so um, I had a feeling that she and I knew each other from past lives, so it wasn't like the first rodeo together that we've done maybe work so, together before. So you think she's an old, old friend of yours? Oh, totally, yeah, like an old old teacher, old friend, um, companion, whatever, yeah. So did you have other uh, onboard experiences beyond the four we've mentioned? No, um, but I did have experiences where uh, I was, I would, um, after my first uh, couple of experiences, I noticed I was seeing UFOs all the time in here on Earth and even, you know, during daytime. And uh, I was able to telepathically communicate with a couple of those um, UFOs, which was totally bizarre, but... but um, no, not really. <laughs> not yeah. really at all. Not at all. Yeah, I mean, it, I, mean it, I guess because there was an aspect of uh, my consciousness that expanded, you know, now, and I may be in closer resonance with their frequency than I was before I had the experiences. Well... Uh, I don't think, oh, how do I put this? Uh, yeah. I don't think you have to be a uh, somebody who gets on board alien craft to be, have a, to have a mental uh, psychic connection to aliens. I don't think you have to have onboard experiences no. to get that. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. I, I think it can happen for any of us, actually. Uh, well, and yeah. So, um, of all the things that have happened to you in this incarnation, besides besides being on board craft, what other things you have you gone through that are just as amazing as your on board experiences? Uh, there was just weird um, things that have happened afterwards uh, where I would find myself let's say, driving through. Uh, like the mountains in Colorado and I was, there would be free, I would go through various uh, dimensions. And the reason why I knew this is because um, the- oh, Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, stop, yeah. stop for a second. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so have you heard Willie Strieber talk about his, uh, where he's driving along, he's got a young man, uh, like a boy in the car with him, and uh and all of a sudden he like takes an exit or something and he's in it he's like uh you know back in time or a different dimension or what do you have you ever heard that i haven't heard of his story but i've heard of other stories similar to that okay um, is that what you're yeah. talking about when you say you went into other dimensions is that what you're talking about yes that's what i'm talking about yes okay so you're um, driving your car 
you were driving, right? Yeah, driving, yeah. And uh, take us through one of those experiences. Uh, let me do the one. Uh, there was there was a few times that ha this happened. Go through uh, all. Was, go through all three of them. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, uh, and then there's another experience that was even more bizarre than this. We'll but, go through that one after the three. Yeah. These. Uh, yeah. There was. I would say uh, two times that where it was really noticeable. But uh, the first time was I was uh, going towards. So I live in um, I live in Colorado. I live just south of Denver um, in a, in a town called Castle Rock. But I used to work in a city called Colorado Springs, and so sometimes uh, you know, and I used to work for the health department. So I would you know, I would make calls to different parts of the county um, as part of my job. So uh, one time I was driving for work, and I was driving. Um, in the uh, western part of the county where it, there was Manitou Springs and beyond Manitou Springs, there was Woodland Park and you know, Divide and things like that. And uh, these are, you know, all towns. And they, these were, you know, going through mountain passes, you know. So as I was going through the mountain pass, I was noticing that the colors were shifting, the the, the the scenery was shifting. The trees were starting to have auras around them, and when you see a tree aura, it's very it's very. I mean, it, it, they have beautiful auras. Um, 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 and it just felt like I was in a different dimension. I was probably still on planet Earth. I didn't feel like I was going in a different, I wasn't, it felt like I was going in the future or going in the past, but what it did feel like is I was going into higher dimensions. And so, and so there was let me, components. Let me ask you, let me, let yeah. me ask you a question for, about yeah. it real quick. Okay. So is it possible, okay, so I'm going to tell you a very short event in my life. There was one okay. day I was in Houston, Texas, where uh, I had like, it was like I was in a higher mind state or a higher dimension or whatever. It's hard to explain. That's part of my question. So yeah. I was just walking around in a particular area of this little park in Houston, and everything was brighter than normal. Everything was very different. It was just like regular, but much brighter uh, volume, uh, it was just like you turned up. The, it's like you went from a regular TV to an ultra high def, you know, fifty thousand dollar TV sort of thing. You know, just a higher resolution, higher, um, um, higher, just, just frequency, bro better, yeah. brighter, you know, higher frequency, whatever. It's yeah, well, that's what this was like. Yeah, this was yeah. like that. So that that comes into my question is: is it is are you on a higher dimension? Or are you in a higher mind state? That's I mean, it the could question. Have been either. Yeah, that's 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 why you you, can, you don't know which it is, do you? No, I don't really. Okay, because, all right. Well, keep going through the experience. Go ahead. Yeah, well, just just uh, no, it's just the experience of everything just got amped up, like you were saying, where you know the the sun was really bright, the colors were brighter, the trees, the de even the details of the trees were very sh much sharper and and so it was the same environment but just really amped up and, and you could see uh, the auras of the trees yeah the auras of the trees and, and could you see the, could you see the auras of anything else oh the rocks the, you know the, the everything ground, auras of everything everything, everything yeah okay, so okay was, keep going um, so that was one experience and then i had a similar experience um well hold on back up back up yeah, yeah. Okay. How long? How long were you from when you're driving, and it started, from the time it started to the time it finished? How long were you in that higher mind state or higher dimension? Maybe a few minutes. Maybe oh, is it was that all? Yeah, I was, it was just a few I was in it all day. I was in it for a whole day. But uh, yeah. 
go ahead go ahead with your next experience after that yeah maybe maybe like 10 or i don't know 15 minutes i mean it, it didn't last long um, okay go on with your next experience after that experience uh so i was driving between uh i don't know uh the north, north part of el paso county which is uh you know a, 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 a camp the county that is south of the county I live in, which is Douglas County. So I was traveling from that county on the back roads towards Castle Rock, but hitting, but going on the back roads. Um, and so this takes you through a lot of open space and uh, a, a little little park, and you know, so was, you know, again in this very natural environment, and you know, just driving through and. Uh, once again, it was very similar to the first experience where I saw things shifting and changing. Uh, the trees had the immediate, uh, you know, they had these very bright auras. The rocks were shimmering. They had bright auras. All the environment just got amped up. And uh, this lasted longer. This lasted like maybe 20 to 30 minutes where I was in this altered state. And what was and what was the difference between the first time and the second time? The difference was that the trees were actually telepathically communicating with me in this. Ah. Instance. Yeah. And what what did they say to you? They they said, "You can see us. You can see us." And I said, "Yes, I can see you." Um, and they seemed excited, like. Um, like, oh, there's a human that can see us, you know, or see us in our, you know, I don't know if they meant their higher state or how they really are, but, um, but that but was the were, extent of the communication. But you were communicating with them on a level where they were like, wow, a human who can, who can communicate with us, right? Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and there was uh, another time where I telepathically could hear what a couple of birds were saying. Like I had these weird experiences. Like uh, one time I even walked into a Starbucks. This was in downtown Colorado Springs, uh, where for some reason, and I don't know why it was this one time, but I could hear everybody's thoughts. And this was a very busy Starbucks. It was sure. like. 50 people it was a larger starbucks so it was like 50 people in this place and uh and i could hear everybody's thoughts and i was asking my guides please turn it off because the thoughts i was hearing were very negative um uh, most humans have very negative thoughts i don't know uh, it was i wouldn't say everybody had negative thoughts i mean i think people were thinking different things but um People were thinking badly about their bosses because it was downtown Colorado Springs. Most of them were probably taking a break from work or they were thinking negatively about themselves. Um, and it was hard for me to hear it. And so, and, and it was, that, I was hearing everybody's thoughts at once. You know, is, that, like, I mean, is, is that the only time you've uh, been in a situation where you were hearing everybody's thoughts? Yeah, the only time this happened. Um, and then I ran out of the Starbucks because I couldn't handle all the thoughts. And as I was passing people down the street, I was picking up on the thoughts, but more individually as I was passing them. Um, right. And uh, and I was asking my guys, please turn this off. I don't like this. Um, and I, I think what it showed me was that or what maybe the whole point of it was that in order for us to become a telepathic uh, race of beings or a telepathic community here on earth, you know, we have to align ourselves with the love consciousness. We can't be mired in negativity because then it infects all of us, you know, so. So you, th so you think that your, your guides were giving you that experience to help you understand how humans need to change? Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and maybe it was a, a part of, maybe it was a part of it, an aspect of it was, you know, you're here to help change that. You know, you're here, you know, on a mission to maybe help people to a, a different state of being. You know, so do you know, they, do you know the names of any of your guides? Not personally, no. I, 
I, you know, I'm not really big on names, actually. I, I, I recognize more frequency. Um, so I, and a lot of times my communication with my guides is very clear audience. Um, so I don't often see them, but I feel their presence. I know they're Arcturian beings, you know, because, uh, you know, the few times that I have seen them in dream state, you know, they, are, you know, they, they present themselves as Arcturian beings, but. So your guides, really are Arctur in... your guides are Arcturian? Oh, totally. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm totally connected with the Arcturian collective. And you've uh, had, you've had a, incarnations as an Arcturian? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Um, Do you remember any of those lifetimes? Oh, so yes. Uh, you do? I, I had to, oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. tell us um, something about uh, just like a 50,000 put perspective of your life as an art. How many, how many incarnations do you, or how many lives do you remember as an Arcturian? Just one or more? Oh, there was more. Um, I, it's hard to say. I would say at least five or six um, that I, I completely remember or, or have some some you mean like memory. the whole life you remember the whole life of, of, of no, just aspects here and there no not the whole life. so <laughs> but, so if yeah. you were let's say for a moment you were a being who was a high, at a higher level than the arcturians and you were thinking about oh before you evolved to that level you were these five or six uh lives as an arcturian what could you say about those five or six lives, if anything, in like a 10 or 20 or 30 second elevator uh, comment? Um, what I remember is that as an Arcturian child, um, they had me go through a lot of different training, and that's common for Arcturus. Uh, they had a lot of different, you, you faded out. Repeat that. Uh, I went through a lot of training, like a lot training. of training in different areas. Uh, okay. And and it was like my whole childhood was nothing but training, you know. So it it felt like I didn't have I didn't play and you know maybe I played and had fun, but it, a lot so, of it was. Going so this training. happened. This happened to you in every all all of your Arcturian lifetimes. No, I would say it was just the one particular one that I remember. Um, uh, there was other uh, Arcturian lifetimes where you know, I was doing a mission or part of a mission in Orion or part of a mission in Lyra. Um, so I was doing different different types of work. Uh, there's also a lifetime where I remember being part of a, uh, a scientific group of Arcturians who were uh, monitoring planet Earth and we were on like a small spacecraft and we crash landed in uh, in the Mediterranean, or um, I was actually in Central Italy, but um, but I don't I don't know why I have such a clear memory of that. But um, uh, but we crash landed, and uh, we had to regroup and figure out after after we landed um, what we were going to do with our. Uh, I think we were first trying to figure out, you know, should we stay here or you know, are we going to do an experiment while we're here? And then we decided we we're going to do an experiment. Um, but it's not like I just remember pieces here and there. I don't really, I, I do remember the planet that I'm from or had at least one lifetime in, um, in Arcturus. Uh, so how many how many past lives do you remember some aspect of overall? How, give me a number. How many past lives do you remember? Uh, any um, of, relatively speaking. Um, I would say as far as on planet Earth, at least. No, just four. period. Period. All, all period. the past lives you had in, in your whole existence. How many past lives do you remember so far? Relatively speaking. About 20. I don't know. 20. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. And yeah, I mean, what what besides uh, your lifetime now and your life five lifetimes, five or six as an Arcturian, what else have you been? I remember uh, Pleiades. I know the Pleiades very well. I mean, it's kind of shocking. Like, so you're a, so you a Pleiadian. 
Oh yeah, I had I had past lives as Pleiadian. Yeah, totally. Tell tell us something about your lifetime, your lives as a Pleiadian. Uh, there was a past life. It's, it's kind of interesting because um, when I remember the Pleiades, I remember each of the different systems within because the, the Pleiades is, has fourteen stars. I mean, it's seven which are really well known, and I remember like the different cultures and civilizations that were in these different star systems. Uh, and I also remember a lot of what I did. Um, so, for instance, I, I remember a past life in Merope, uh, which is one of the star, Pleiadian star systems, as a, um, a priestess healer that was healing people from past trauma from Lyra. So uh, I did a lot of psychospiritual work. And I remember what the planet looked like. I remember there was three moons on this planet. And it always kind of looked dark. It always looked like dusk or dawn. It, it never got dark like night, but it kind of looked like dusk or dawn um, on this planet. And uh, there were three moons. And I remember a matriarchal society of women that were running this planet or controlling things on the planet and uh, and I I, I uh, from what I can remember I think I was pretty well respected like uh, um, and I I looked more humanoid um, than I did in my my Arcturian lifetimes where I had more of an Arcturian form uh, uh, so I looked humanoid but I'm probably taller um, and I remember my skin being very white, but my hair was dark, you know, so um, so I didn't look like a stereotypical Pleiadian that you always see depicted you know, in ufology. Um, so but, so uh, regarding the, the Arcturians and the Pleiadians, obviously, while you're here on this planet and you're interacting with them on their ship, you're on a higher dimension, we, you and I believe. But yeah. uh, right now we're talking about lifetimes on the physical plane. When you when you were a Pleiadian, you were also Arcturian in the past, right? Pleiadian and Arcturian. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in those lifetimes, were you on the physical plane or on a higher plane? I think probably on a higher dimension, but maybe still physical. So it might have been like fifth dimensional Pleiades. Or okay, so you, you were yeah. both, both Pleiadian and Arcturian, you were on a higher dimension, but it was all still just as physical as this one. Yeah, yeah, there, it, it felt physical. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, but it felt like with the Arcturian lifetimes, like if I was in a different star system, that I was pulling my vibration down to interact with the beings in that star system. So it felt like, uh, like my normal state of being might have been a, as a light body, maybe like seventh or eleventh dimensional Pleiadian, but I mean not Pleiadian, sorry, Arcturian. But I was pulling my vibration down, and and inhabiting a physical body in order to interact with uh, beings on different planets, you know, that were maybe not, you know, 11th dimension or 7th dimension. So, uh, so how many, how many in previous incarnations do you re remember on this planet? Um, only four. Uh, well, that's, the when you say only four, that's like, okay, <laughs> that's not like, okay. You say it only, you know, to me, it's like, wow, you know, if you can remember one, it's great. If you've been regressed to a bunch, that's fine. But without any regressions, if you can remember four, that's to me, that's impressive. So yeah, uh, yeah, no, what no, what no. Uh, give us uh, is there anything you could say about those four previous lifetimes that stands out? Like, were you uh, were you ever in Atlantis? Were you ever in Lemuria? Were you ever um uh, um and are any of those four lifetimes amazing to you beyond the fact that it was you but i mean in general if you thought about it now you know what is amazing to a human or any of those four lifetimes on earth amazing in any way shape or form uh the lemurian life was pretty amazing so um, you were, you were in lemuria 
Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, were you in Lantis also, or just, Lemur or just Lemurich? Yeah. I, I don't get a sense I was ever connected with Atlantis. Um, okay, so tell us about your tell us about your Lemurian laptop. Uh, I saw myself as a female, very tall, uh, kind of maybe there was. Uh, I remember having darker skin, darker hair, but very beautiful or considered to be beautiful in that time, uh, and. Uh, ability to fly which was interesting um she since in this lifetime i'm afraid of heights so um but i think there was a reason for that um uh but i remember i remember being able to fly and also being able to swim and not uh not need any kind of apparatus uh and it was a very free-flowing life i i do remember doing some sort of spiritual work um uh, uh, I, I did some sort of crystal crystal work or uh, maybe working with crystal frequencies. Um, but there was also a lot of, um, I remember having a husband and uh, um, having family, uh, but everything was beautiful. It was, it was pretty kind of Polynesia-like, you know, like kind of like living in Moana, you know, that's <laughs> Like, you know, because I remember myself walking on the beach and, um, uh, but um, I don't know, it was kind of a strange story, but, and I don't, I don't remember all the components, but somehow I got killed by uh, Atlantean, uh, so the Atlanteans were attacking Lemuria and uh, one of their ships kind of passed through and were shooting lasers out to to kill, you know, the Lemurians. And, you know, I was I was flying overhead to try to see if I can communicate with them to see why they were shooting at us. And they shot me down and uh, I fell to the ground from very high up. So I think that's why I'm afraid of heights today. But so do, you, uh, do, uh, do you know why the Atlanteans and Lemurians were at war with each other? My understanding, maybe not from this memory, but from, uh, you know, the research I've done from, you know, I guess my the Akashic record is that the Atlanteans got infiltrated by negative Orion factions that were trying to incite a war. Um, between the Atlanteans and the Lemurians so that they can burn the vibration of the planet down um, because the Lemurians were holding the fifth, fifth dimensional frequencies. And so they somehow, uh, they somehow uh, convinced the Atlanteans that the, that the Lemurians were their enemies, which is kind of bizarre to think about, but, um, but that was... Uh, and I don't, like I said, I don't know all the specifics behind it, but, but my understanding was that there was, uh, in, they were being corrupted. The government was corrupted by these negative alien factions that were trying to bring, bring the vibration of the planet down. And they, they were successful because after the fall of Maria, uh, that was when we, we went from the fifth dimension into the third dimension. You mean the whole planet? The whole planet, yeah, totally, yeah. Okay, so, um, so you do Akashic Record readings now. How did you get into that? It didn't happen like overnight. So it wasn't like I woke up from you know my extraterrestrial contact experiences and say, oh, I want to be an Akashic reader now. I took a lot of spiritual classes um, and I didn't really talk about my experience publicly, you know, for a few years, even after 2012. I, I think the first time I spoke publicly about my extraterrestrial contact experience was in 2000, the end of 2015. It was December of that month, actually, or that year. But uh, I just noticed that I was getting downloads of information about galactic wars, galactic history, uh, extraterrestrial beings, different star systems. All of a sudden, I knew 
all the different star systems and and the stars that are within these systems and the galaxies and and, and everything. And I was just why why how do I know this information? And then I was also picking up random information about people I would run into, you know, just random people, even people I didn't really know well. I would know that oh this person uh their family name means this and th th their family name has a specific crest and it has a griffin on their crest and, uh, you know it's weird random information or or they had a past life as a celtic warrior or they are very connected with the pleiades or or alpha centauri or you know i mean it's just kind of random weird information and so i was asking one of my spiritual teachers um uh, that I, I took some of her classes. Uh, I was asking her, where am I getting this information from? You know, it seems like I, I, I know this random information. And she told me I was getting it from the Akashic Records. And I didn't even know what the Akashic Records were at that time. And so in 2014, I took my first Akashic Records reading course. And I went I took the uh, like level one and then level two and level three. And, and who was your who was your teacher? Uh, her name was Olivia Lundberg. Um, I think she's still practicing. So, uh, Say her name one more time. Olivia Lundberg. Okay, Olivia Lundberg. So uh, you had what? How many classes? Three or four? I've had. I uh, I would have. They would she would teach the classes and levels so she had like a two week long class that was level one and then another two week long class that was level two and then another th two week long class that was level three so uh, were they expensive classes or in inexpensive um they weren't cheap <laughs> yeah they were she, no they weren't cheap classes uh they were not cheap um, no not cheap, no um uh I would say um, at the time, I, I think she's raised her prices because I took this a few years ago. She was charging five hundred dollars a class, but um, with, if you took all three levels, that was maybe like fifteen hundred total. Um, but um, but she and was so a, a former university professor. But she was a really good teacher. You know, I, I learned a lot from her and I took other classes besides the Akashic classes with her. So, so uh, if you wanted to tell somebody how to read the Akashic records themselves, your yeah. own Akashic records, and you could, could you say something uh, that would, you know, you're not going to obviously teach them much in a, a three, three sentence uh, class, but could you tell people in general how to read their Akashic records uh, without um, without spending fifteen hundred dollars? Yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, you know, as far as I think, as far as accessing the records, first of all, you need to connect yourself with higher realms, and the way I do it is just imagine a column of light that's connecting me um, through planet Earth through my body to the higher realms, which is the Akashic records. And I just imagine this column of light connecting me with the records. And then you always want to set an intention of either reading your own records or reading someone else's records. Uh, I like to use uh, Linda Howe, the pathway prayer process. Uh, and you can you can access that probably even online on her website or even you know maybe even purchasing her book um, how to read the akashic records so this is linda howe and i i do just like because it just helps to set intention um i do a little space clearing first so i always do that before i even start the uh, connection through the light column but then um uh, but then I do the pathway prayer process. I say the person's name if I'm doing a reading for someone else. Or I might say my own name if I'm doing a reading for myself. And then uh, you say the records are now open, and then you're connected with the records. With me, when I do it, I kind of feel a click inside. It's kind of like a little click or a little shift inside my brain because you are connecting to a higher level consciousness. 
And then I, it's kind of like I see a movie. So um, if I'm accessing a certain person's records, I see like a movie being playing out. Um, but when you're in the Akashic records, it's actually a multi clear experience. So you might communicate with the Akashic guides, you might get, be getting clear audience messages. You'll see uh, uh, visuals, you know, through your third eye. So you'll see, you know, there's their soul journey. Um, and then uh, you might even have, you know, a clear sense of clairsentience or, you know, clear existence or, um, so there's various ways you can you receive information when you're in the records. So it can be a very exhausting experience for some people when they're first starting out um, because you're trying to interpret things in a multi-psychic level. But um, I would say raising your vibration would be the first, you know, clearing space, raising your vibration through the column of light exercise, and then uh, uh, setting intention. So I, I use the pathway prayer, but people can set and mention whatever way they want to. And then, uh, you know, obviously, if you're reading for someone, you want to use their full name and their birth date because that helps you to access their particular records. And then uh, th then you feel the connection. You know, to me, it's kind of like I feel that little click in my head or the little shift. And then I know I'm in there. Um, so that helps your, your listeners, but well, that's how I do it, yeah. So do you teach people how to read the Akashic Records, or do you just do Akashic Records uh, readings? Right now, we're currently, as we speak, developing a galactic Akashic reading course, which will be offered this year in April or May. Um, we're formulating the course as we speak, so it will be available soon, and I can't wait to... Uh, it'll be an eight week long course because we're going to get uh, much deeper into galactic history, different star races. So it's, a, um, it's also like a, a tutorial on galactic history in addition to learning how to read records. Um, this will be available in about uh, a, f a couple of months from now. So, um, so is it going to be an expensive course or what? It's not. It's, it's going to be fairly expensive because we put a lot of work into it. Um, we created uh, a lot of videos. Uh, there's a lot of supplemental materials um, that are going to help people navigate the galactic Akashic records. So um, but, uh, I'm offering this as a service to people. So. Um, uh, so I just want to make it very clear that you don't have to take my course to be able to read any kind of Akashic records, whether it be the galactic records, earth records, whatever. Um, but a lot of people have asked me to teach them, so that's why I'm developing this course. And so uh, I've heard people say that the Akashic records are only for humans, and I don't quite believe that. But uh, But I've heard... Okay, so I've heard quite a few near-death experiences where people get on the other side and they go to heaven and they see a bunch of humans and then other people meet like light beings and things of that nature on the other side. But mm -hmm. I, but what I have not heard is anybody say, I went to heaven and I saw um, um, greys and Pleiadians and, you know, but I've heard Paul Hamden say that the like you know like for instance the greys will just put their move their consciousness from one body to the next and never they never go on to the other side and so you wonder you know hearing all those near-death experiences where people go to heaven and they never mention any alien races of any kind ever not even one time in heaven and you're like is heaven only for humans you know what how do you what do you you got any comments about all that any of that um, I, let, me, let me see if I can formulate some thoughts around this. Uh, I don't believe there's a heaven or a hell. I, you know, I, I believe that there, we go through a higher state of consciousness. You know, we, uh, you know, leave the earth plane and go through a life review um, in this higher state of consciousness. Um, and then we're assisted by our higher selves and our higher guidance, you know, to 
you know, maybe select will be our next incarnation or our next iteration of, of experiences. Um, so I don't know buy into the heaven thing so much. Um, I think well, people maybe people go into the light, right? Or they know the, they go through the tunnel and then they see the yeah, light. They go through some sort of, yeah, some sort of portal. You know, I think it's more of a portal, but yeah. Um, okay. And then, uh, you know, there, uh, what I believe is that, and this is just, you know, from, you know, the work that I've done, the work that Jay Hurtak has done with his book, The Key to Beanock, that Arcturus is the location of this place where people get through their, their, go through their life reviews, they get processed after death. Um, but I think maybe um, the reason why they're not necessarily seeing aliens is because, or is because they're interacting with higher dimensional beings that are maybe not saying, oh, we're Arcturians or we're this or we're that, but- There's beings of light. Beings of light, yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, so they, they might look like angelic beings, they might, you know, they might look like uh, light beings, but they're not specifically saying, oh, I'm, I'm Arcturian or, oh, I'm Pleiadian, because when you're in the higher realms, that doesn't really matter. You know, um, you're just a light being. Exactly. Yeah. So you're part of you're a closer aspect of source, maybe. But um, sure. But you're, you're having this higher dimensional aspect experience in the higher realms. So so, um, you know, so when we have these extraterrestrial uh, lifetimes, you know, maybe we're in the fifth dimension, maybe we're in the sixth dimension, but we're having more of a physical experience as a higher level extraterrestrial being. But uh, when people are going through a near death experience, they're 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 not going into the Pleiadian realm or the the physical Arcturian realm. They're going into the higher realm that's even higher dimensional than that. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's. That's my interpretation. So you think the other side is tending to be an even higher dimension than the one, fifth, sixth, and all that? It's more like a, you know, a twelfth or fifteenth dimension or whatever. It, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, I think it's like uh, so. Uh, we too are just light aspects of source, but. But then we're going through this process of, okay, I've had this experience on Earth, and this is what I learned, this is what maybe I could have done better, or this is what my goals for the next incarnation. Well, okay, so, you know, uh, you're familiar with 20 lifetimes, which is quite impressive. So, have you ever had, do you ever remember having any experience where you were choosing your incarnation? Yes, I have, actually. I had a dream about it. That I was uh, in this, this state where what people would call it a near-death experience, where I was um, either assisting somebody choosing a life or it was me choosing a life, but I, I saw what that realm looked like. And uh, it's they usually give you like a choice of lifetimes. So, I mean, because we're free will beings and, you know, we can choose, you know, what we want to experience. And, uh, and, and a lot of times it's, it's very random, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, but I think for those of us here that are on earth right now, we get a contract to be on earth like X amount of lifetimes, you know, so we come here understanding that, you know, we're going to be here on Earth for a few lives, you know, or maybe just one or two lives. I don't know. But uh, but we, we usually even make planetary contracts like, you know, hey, I choose to be here on Earth in order to have to, to be of service or to uh, have a mission or to maybe go through some lessons or learn some things. So it would help me on my overall journey, higher evolution as a, as a soul. So do you remember any of your names in any of your previous lifetime? Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm not really with names. It, it, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't. That's it's, fine. It's not, yeah, it's, it's fine. not that important to me. Um, I just like to remember more experiences, maybe. Um, so uh, well, and, it's like, it's yeah. like Piglet. Piglet. 
Piglet is yeah. not really Piglet, but that's the name no. you gave her. So right. that is one of her names, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's like I don't really, I don't know why I don't get into it. Because I, I get clients who ask me what their names are and like during an Akashic reading. And if they ask their guides, like, like I, I guess I could usually get a name for them. <laughs> you no, know, like I, uh, uh, usually with myself, I don't know. I just don't focus on it. Um, have you have not, you ever ha have you ever had a near death experience? Um, not that I know of, but um, but I've had experiences where um, where I felt like there was an alternate reality that was occurring. Like what? for instance, like maybe I was connecting with source or. I don't know if I could really call that a near death experience. How, how many times? How many of those experiences have you had? Like maybe uh, two or three times. Can you go I've through those? That. Can you go through those? Um. Yes, I'll go through at least one of them. Um, okay. uh, I had an experience once where I was driving home from work, and all of a sudden. It felt like I was being pulled out of my body. I was still driving, you know, so I think it was just like uh, my you're still you're still moving. you're still what driving? Driving, yeah. So I'm still driving. My body okay. is still in the car, but my higher consciousness connected with what I think was source energy because I like you were saying with your experience, you felt this level of love that you never felt before in your life, and you felt this level of it like like completeness and and peacefulness that's how i felt and i was surrounded by this golden light like it was like i was in the light but also separate from the light and i remember thinking oh this is being with god feels like um and i i never, i didn't want to leave i didn't want to return to my body i didn't want to do anything but then and it probably lasted like a few seconds and then boom i was back in my body you know so back in my car driving so uh, so I've had experiences like that. I don't know if I can really call that a near-death experience. No, no. Well, okay. So it sounds like, um, okay. So we call things, um, we ha we give a name to things like near-death right. experience. Right. Because, um, because people have at car accidents and things like that where they are near, you know, they're on a, a a table getting operated so they are near death the, their brain stops working and you know so we call it near death because that's part of that experience but it doesn't mean that you have to go through any of those pieces to get to that same realm is what i'm saying exactly yeah so uh there's components of an extraterrestrial contact experience or an out-of-body contact experience that have similarities to a near-death experience, but but maybe the um, the way you go about it is different. You know, like you were saying, like uh, like maybe you had to go through an accident to have that you know alternate dimensional experience. But in my case, maybe I just had to fall asleep to have that alternate dimensional experience. So, you know, well, so it's the, different. the a lot of the people that have near-death experiences, when they come back, they retain that connection. So they have a tendency. I mean, a lot of them die again uh, after they come back over and over. They're like hanging on with a thread in the hospital. So they're actually having more near-death experiences. But other people are more stable over here, but they still have that connection. So they still keep going back over there, even though they're they're not their health is not uh poor even though they right. yeah and so they you know or there not, are certain gifts that get activated after they have the near death experience well the, yeah, yeah. My, my point is that they're having the same experience you did in the car as a result of their near death experience but it the the extra the extra experiences of them going back over there is not them dying again it's just the fact that they've made that connection and they're keeping it and they keep going back and forth you did the same thing you just did it without the near-death experience before that. yeah i just didn't have the near-death experience had to die or in an accident or you know have some sort of traumatic thing that happened you know so do you have experience. do you have any idea why 
uh, was there anything you were doing uh, like just before that? Like, was there something like you were let, I'll give you an example. I was, uh, I had uh, one of my close encounters with beings, with a being, an invisible being in an apartment because I was doing a new age experiment that lasted a week with crystals and stuff like that. And so uh, I think that opened me up to, to be able to have an encounter with this invisible being that came into my apartment. So, but the point I'm here making here is that uh, it, it was the ch the um, the thing I was going through the the uh, ritual or the the um, what I was doing. What we did was we put a a blue green activated crystal, taped it on our wrist or the back of our hand, and then another one or on our wrist, and another one was in a glass full of water that we were drinking. That uh, and these were activated crystals. So that's what, and we were, you know, you would be encouraged to drink the water as much as you could. And, you know, I won't go through the experience, but the point is that I was going through some type of event, uh, ritual, belief, or ceremony, or something on earth that allowed that connection to be made. So was there anything like that you were doing or going through or, you know, anything in your life? That were, you know those same that same time when you had that uh, out of body experience of the light. I, actually, no, it was happened even before my my spiritual awakening experience. So I. So you so you came into this world with plenty of talent. That's what you're saying. Uh, evidently, but it was uh, dormant for a lot of years. You know, so, um, well, that's so okay. I, I mean, it, yeah, it, no, it was, there's no, it was there's no real time. Uh, you know? That's just our yeah. illusion, you know. Yeah, no, but I, evidently, I, I had maybe these were skills I had all along, but I, I you know, I didn't know why I was having these experiences, or um, at least not until I had, you know, the ex that 2012 extraterrestrial contact experience where things kind of got waned, you know, but. Um, but yeah, I've had kind of, um, I've had, have had encounters with higher dimensional beings, as, you know, as a young adult. I mean, it was always kind of like some random thing that would happen that was kind of weird. So that's why I had always had the sense that there was something about me that was different, you know, or not from here or, um, but so I how, couldn't so put how, my fingers so, on it. So how did you, uh, how did you come up with your 20 past lives how did you uh, get that information some of it was just random memories or downloads i received um maybe through meditation or through a dream state uh other times it was me actively looking at my akashic records um and then i would see that lifetime and I'm like, oh yeah i remember that lifetime <laughs> you know um so when uh, when you when you are in the uh, when you are in the reading the Kashuk record, do you um, do you visualize or see how how do you get the information from the Kashuk records? How does it come to you in your head? It's like I see a movie. It's like I see like I'm playing a movie and I'm seeing a scene of me doing something and I, this is how I how it is with when I do readings for other people too um where I'm just I'm getting random scenes from different lifetimes and then I, I connect with a certain scene and I kind of follow through kind of like picking out a Netflix movie out of a selection of movies and uh but a lot of it's very visual for me um but I'm also getting information or messages from the Akashic guides or that person's guides or my guides. Um, and uh, sometimes I'm hearing music. Sometimes I've, I, I smell things from that lifetime. Have you I ever seen, a, have you ever seen any of your guides visually? Um, just in dream state. Yeah. Uh, they look like Arcturian beings, like the beings on board the ship. Yep. Um, so your guides are Arcturian. Oh, yeah, I mentioned that before, yes. So do you, you also have Pleiadian guys or just Arcturian? 
I have guides from different star systems, mostly Arcturian and Pleiadian, because those are the two systems I think I spent the most time in. But How many guides do you have? I, uh, well, the Arcturian collective is vast, you know, so there's probably hundreds of so you're, you're Arcturian probably interact. So, so your Arcturian guides is a collective. Yeah, they they act as a collective, but then there there also there's also individual aspects of that collective that come forward that interact more directly with me. So, so when, um, when they're when they're interacting with you as a collective, how if let's say for instance, I um, had never met an Arcturian, and I yeah. somehow I interact with one uh, on whatever level you do, and. Mm -hmm. The individual, but then all of a sudden, a minute later, five minutes later, I'm interacting with the collective. Explain to me how you experience the collective differently than the individual. The collective is more like a, a web. I don't know how to explain this, but it's like a, a web of frequency and and it's like I'm hearing messages. If it, it sounds like it's coming from a group, um, when I'm interacting with one of them individually, it's like I'm having a conversation with you. So they're telling me things, but it sounds like it's coming from one individual being as opposed to a whole group of beings. So when you're hearing from the collective, do you hear uh three, four, five, six, eight beings talking to you simultaneously? It'll be like quite a few of them speaking simultaneously. And what's the most number you've recognized of different individuals within the collective all speaking at the same time? How, how many have you talked with at the same time? It's hard to say. Um, uh, because they, the name, their voices don't come out different or? Yeah, it's because they're all speaking at once. So it sounds like there's a lot of them, but I, I couldn't get a number, you know. How do you, so. how do you even know they're, they're a different being talking with, you know, five or six or 10 or whatever? How do you even know they're not one? I mean, you get what I'm I mean, saying? it could be one consciousness, honestly, um, but it sounds like there's a few of them speaking at once. So, um, do, you, do they sound? Does one sound different in some way than the next one as a, a within the collective? It just sounds like it's amplified. Like it's, uh, like I said, it's hard to hard to describe it. But yeah. It's, yeah, it just sounds very amplified, like like you're at a let me let me see if this helps. Um, like you're at a sports game and everybody running at the same time, like go team. That's what it sounds like. Like they're all kind of saying this like all at once, um, but it's very amplified. Um, it, does, it doesn't get jumbled when many of them are speaking simultaneously. No, not at all. No, they're very uniform. Yeah, very very uniform. Interesting. So, yeah. so you have Arcturian guy, uh, the Arcturian collective, individual Arcturian guides, uh, Pleiadian guides, and other guides. Yeah, from other systems. What other? Uh, what do you know of any? Do you know the the details about your non Arcturian, non Pleiadian guides? Can you tell us any about uh, that? There is a couple of them that are connected with the Syrian mystery schools because I did go through those schools. Which and, which mystery uh, school? Say it again. Syrian, Syrian mystery Syrian. schools. Syrian. That's what I thought you said. It, it kind of was yeah, blurry. Syrian, because uh, I went through those schools. Um, uh, there's, uh, I'm connected. I Sometimes I get messages from Kuan Yin. Um, so I have a connection with that, that being. Uh, sometimes I interact with me who is an so i have like two or three ascended masters when you say Kwan, when you say kwan yin is he the fellow that the ekis talk about uh kwan yin is the female entity that is the goddess of of love consciousness in um i guess buddhist uh buddhist practice uh, but she's also an ascended master uh but i i understand her to be feminine a feminine entity. Um, so, if somebody wanted to read about Kuan Yin, 
Where would they go to find something about her? They can just do a search on Google and find lots of information about her. She's, but but who, you know, is there a group of people who understand her better than others? I would say the Buddhist, um, Buddhist, the Buddhist religion. Yeah, yeah. Would okay. uh, probably have a very good, really good understanding of who Kuan Yin is. Uh, okay, so you, you mentioned Octarians, Pleiadians, Kuan Yin. Uh, who else? Well, you mentioned somebody else that was one of. Uh, Kuthumi is an ascended master from Sirius. So, Kuthumi. Um, Kuthumi, yeah. He was the ascended master that incarnated as St. Francis of Assisi on planet Earth. So um, so he's a pretty prominent uh, and uh, advanced soul. Um, I've had interactions with, I mean, with the ascended masters, it's more random. So it's not like I can communicate with them all the time. Um but uh, it's, a lot of times it depends. Uh, I, I also feel a connection with Andromeda Galaxy. So I have some some guys that are just light beings, you know, that they don't really have a form. Um, but I understand their consciousness to be from Andromeda Galaxy. So I, I interact with those beings sometimes, too. So can you, uh, the light beings from Andromeda, can you give us an experience where you interacted with one of them, uh, just a snippet, something. Um, usually, uh, those beings, um, I usually feel or I, I'm able to see like a bluish white sparkling light. Uh, that's you know, usually it happens when I'm meditating, um, or in uh, connected with like a consciousness state of being and. And I don't know why, but I recognize the frequency as being from Andromeda Galaxy. And it's usually kind of a whitish blue, but kind of also very sparkly kind of energy. And they usually speak more with frequency rather than with words. So a lot of times when I communicate with them, it's more visuals maybe um, than with words. Uh, because they're, they're kind of beyond words, actually. Uh, but uh, for my 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 uh, human mind, you know, they they provide messages via maybe sacred geometry or maybe symbolism or you know some sort of visual. Um, so that's how I communicate with them. Um, so uh, of, of all the teachings you've ever learned that you remember from, let's say, if you remember your teachings as an Arcturian, a Pleiadian and your teachings, things you've learned on Earth. Is there any set of teachings which are you consider to be like, I mean, there's also what you learned from the Akashic Records. So if you added up uh, what you've learned as an Arcturian, as a Pleiadian, as a Lemurian, as uh, it, within the Akashic Records, and anything else you've learned, uh, any other teachings that I haven't mentioned, is there any set of teachings which you consider to be like um, maybe um, more profound or like, you know, the ultimate teaching? See, the Kasha record, that's a record. It's not really a teaching. It's a record of events. It's just a record of events. Yeah. Right. So it's not really a teaching. But it, is there... Anything you were that you could relate from any lifetime that you 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 would tell people go uh, focus in that area. You know, you know, is there a teaching which you think is profound that you could relate? I was probably the teachings from Arcturus are probably yeah. the most advanced or. And is there any access to that besides uh, somebody like yourself who was? in Arcturus and could pull that up, is there any way you could get that? Uh, okay, so there's a couple, there's some books like We Are we are the Arcturians and things like that, right? Yeah, I, I would say if somebody was really interested in connecting with the teachings of the Arcturians, I think uh, Tom Kenyon, he wrote this really fabulous book called The, uh, the Arcturian Anthology. Um, that's a really good one to access. Uh, we the Arcturians, David K. Miller's books, you know, uh, connecting with the Arcturians. There's some really wonderful information. I think he's written like several 
versions of that book. So like a part one, part two, part three, part four. But um, so I don't so know, if I you could, you pick out one book uh, that would teach you the best thing, you know, I, I'm going to stick you on an island. You're only going to get one book about Arcturians or the Arcturian teachings. It could be either way about the Arcturians or about the teachings of the Arcturians. Which book would you pick and why? I think if you want to know about the Arcturian culture and what the culture is like, uh, we the Arcturians is the choice. But if you want to know about the teachings, the, Ar the Arcturian anthology would be the choice. And what was the author's name of the Arcturian anthology? Tom Kenyon. Tom, I spell his last name. K, K E N Y O N. Okay. Just like well, a Tom Kenyon. Tom Kenyon. Yeah. The Arcturian anthologies. Yeah. It's plural, right? Anthologies. No, antho. No, just anthology. 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 Yeah. Ar the Arcturian anthology. Yeah, that would be the book I would say would focuses more on Arcturian teachings. Um, if you want to know about Arcturian culture, what they were like, you know, what their ships were like, you know, how they their day to day life, probably be the Arcturians would be the better choice. So um, yeah, I've got a copy. <laughs> I've got a copy yeah. of that one, but I don't remember yeah. a single thing from the book. Yeah, no, it's pretty overwhelming when you first read it. It's just like what? <laughs> it's like uh, because well, I think yeah. If if you if you read a bunch of facts. And you don't have, let's say you were never an Arcturian. I don't remember ever being an Arcturian. It's yeah. just a bunch of facts that's not going to stick in my head because I was never there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, oh, yeah, it's just, you know, information. Um, for someone like me, you know, I read it. It's it's, it's like a remembrance, you know, with it. So, yeah, it's sparking um, your memory and it's going to stick in your head because, yeah. but because you were there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, as you, who you are now, tell us about uh, all your offerings. Okay. Uh, I wish I could say that I can take new clients, but I, I have thousands of people on my reading waiting list, so I am not taking new clients for personal readings right now, but I oh, do offer. Th thousands of people that are waiting for your individual readings? Yeah. Yeah. Se seriously, is. that's nice. Yeah, no, it's thirty five hundred people. That's what my assistant tells me. So it sounds like so you're we're not like double your prices and see how many people drop off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But um, yes, yeah, so we have. Uh, so I'm taking new clients at the moment, but um, I do offer various trainings on my training, the training page on my website that people can just, it's like a pay-per-view. So they just connect with the link on Kajabi, pay for the course and, you know, uh, watch the video about the course. Um, so we have a few of those available and I will be offering my Galactic Akashic reading course in uh, April or May of this year, um, so people can sign for that. Um, so, what do you uh, think so about could, what do you think about Kajabi? Kajabi, it's an interesting platform. It's uh, not the most intuitive. So, I have uh, an IT person that helps me with it, but but it's a really good platform if you have like a series of of training offerings that you just want to keep in one platform that people can access and continue to access. So, uh, so there are really good aspects of it, but it's kind of a um, not a super intuitive. So you, you kind of have to know what you're doing to set things up there. Which so what does Kajabi I'm, do for you? What is, what all does it do for you? Um, Kajabi uh, actually. Um, it just or it just it enables us a platform where uh, we can have a video or people can pay for the video. It um, gives us the opportunity to market um, our courses. Um, it you know organizes the courses like in a library of sorts. So um, and it has more capabilities than that, but I don't use it for the extra capability. But it helps with your sales and everything else. So. Um, so how does how do they charge you? As they charge me a monthly fee with Kajabi. 
So how expensive is it? It's pretty expensive. I don't want to go it, into that, but it's it, So it is expensive. Yeah, it is an expensive program. Yeah. It, um, it is. Yeah. Uh, but you were asking me about my offerings. Uh, I would say we have some trainings on Javi that people can access through my training web uh, training site or training page on my website. Uh, we are going to offer much more intensive courses like the Galactic Akashic Reading Course. And then if they want to see, if they want to just get information, there's a Galactic History section on my website. Where they can read about some of these different races that we talked about today. And um, I have a YouTube channel where I talk, it's mainly folk, uh, showcasing different readings that I've done, where there's a lot of information about extraterrestrial races. Um, and then I'm also on Gaia. So uh, so if people uh, have Gaia subscriptions, they can just search my name and find the interviews that I've been featured on. So how long have you so been using Kajabi? I've been using it now for about a year, and uh, it's been, um, I, I know we we like it. Um, if I can find a cheaper flat platform that does what it do, does, I will definitely <laughs> move all my stuff to a cheaper platform, but for right now, for my needs. Um, but yeah, it is an expensive program. I, I wish it wasn't so expensive. Well, I've seen their commercials recently, just like yeah. for about a week or two. And they talk, you know, there's a guy on there talking about, you know, his first day on Kajabi made like 12 grand his first day, you know, and I'm like, uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> you, yeah, I think they're exaggerating a little bit, there, but, um, but they do help you with your sales and. Uh, um, and I've done well with Kajabi as far as, you know, the sales of my, my programs, so it's worth so checking it, out. So it helps yeah. you it helps you sell your your product. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, anyway, I hope um, we've been on for two and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're about done. Uh, yeah, I uh, yeah. really appreciate you being on the show, and uh, yeah. no, I appreciate your your time and your interest in my work and your interest in all my experiences and uh, and being patient with the technical issues. Uh, so thank you very much for having me on your show. Well, I appreciate you very much for being on the show, and I hope that uh, that a lot of people listen to this show when after I post it on YouTube, and I hope that your um, your success uh, is increased through the people watching the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I. Um, it's all about outreach and helping people to align with uh, their, their true selves, their true missions, you know, uh, uh, you know, being connected with the divine aspects of themselves. So, you know, if the show helps with them with that process, then we've both done a good thing today, tonight. Um, well, let me let me ask you one or two more questions. So, OK. Uh, when you help people. Um, uh, connect with their higher, their their purpose or their higher self or whatever. Right. Uh, what do you tend to do with them other than read? You know, you obviously read their Akashic records. You teach them how to read Akashic records beyond the things that we've talked about. What else do you do to help them connect with their purpose or higher self or whatever it is that you do with them? Well, the Akashic Records reading as also acts as an activation. So, uh, so when they're receiving this information, it also acts, activates them on an energetic level, and so they feel more aligned um, with who they truly are. Uh, and but also, I also do other types of readings besides Akashic readings. So I do an intuitive reading where somebody can just do like a question and answer thing, like if they just have more specific you know questions or uh i also do a star seed origins reading and i do akasha clearings you know so but so all, that, all, all of that is already booked though right as far as what um i mean you said your private readings are booked right oh yeah we're completely yeah they're yeah so i'm not specifically offering that for for new people at this time because well, that's I'm, just the people on the list. You've got a thirty-five. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How yeah, far? Are, how, how far out are you booked? 
I would say right now we're looking at two years. <laughs> it's, it's like so. If somebody be, wanted to get on your list, they could, but they just have to wait over two years. They'll they'll be waiting probably six, eighteen, probably sixteen to eighteen months. I think. Oh, so it's average. it's not a huge deal as long as you have patience. Yeah, patience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> lots of patience. Yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to. I mean, I wouldn't want to wait that long for a reading, but um, well, I've, I mean, I've had clients, yeah, yeah who waited that long. Yeah, that have waited. And were they were they satisfied? Oh yeah, they were very. They were, they said they it was worth the wait. That's what they usually tell me. There, so, there you go. So it, it yeah. is worth waiting. They said it was worth the wait. Yeah. So. Um, well, anyway, thank you for your time and thank you well, for me, having me, me on your show. Yeah, let me stop the recording. Okay, hold on. Okay. Uh, here we go.